important discussion will be about the precipitation kinetics, because that is more or less the, the uniqueness of the, of the software project. And I'm also going to show you a little bit about the long range diffusion module, which we have been used recently in several projects. And the la latest one was the one where we uh, investigated Bainite transformation in steel. So let's see what the Matkalk software package is all about. Uh, the package is developed since 1994, which is, yeah, I was counting the years, it's 27 years, and uh, the picture that you see is from 2000. Uh, that's actually from the, the second best time of, of a life that you can have, the postdoc uh, years. Uh, the software itself is designed from the beginning, more or less from the beginning as a, a modular thing. So there's a command line interface. Uh, uh, several people know about that. Uh, there's a command line version which can be used on any kind of parallel computing uh, machines and so on. And there's also uh, the libraries which uh, are available and that are used by some people uh, um, controlled by their own uh, code yeah, just uh, using Matkalk as a, as a calculation engine. Uh, one of the things that uh, makes Matkalk very flexible is the fact that we are using Kalfa databases. And I remember Busse having said that you have to take care about your own Kalfa databases. Uh, we have uh, worked on that uh, for more than 10 years now, and there is uh, three types of databases available under the Open Database License. Uh, you can download it from the Matkarik web page, and the Open Database License is a very nice one because it tells you that you can use the database, you can modify it as much as you want, and the only thing that you have to do, you have to mention who was the first one to publish that. Um, that should actually be uh, working also with open Calfat. Maybe uh, one or the other one tries that out. Uh, the, the key uh, model in Matkark is precipitation kinetics uh, with a simplification of mean field. I'm coming back to that and uh, applying the thermodynamic extremal principle, but for that later. One topic that uh, we work on since um, several years now is microstructure evolution. And just to give you a few keywords, uh, it's about plastic deformation, flow curve calculation, recrystallization and grain growth. And the, the one thing which is nice is that it's fully coupled to the precipitation model. Uh, it's just here on this last page where you can see this uh, recrystallization precipitation interaction diagram uh, where the lines uh, indicate the different degrees of recrystallization starting with 10% going up to 90%. Uh, the C curve here describing vanadium carbonitrite precipitation from 5 to 90%. And we can see that this interaction very strongly retards and almost yeah, avoids recrystallization, which um, yeah, we have published uh, that stuff uh, to not enough time for today. For today, I, I want to show an example where we have the long range diffusion module. This is the finite difference uh, formulation a little bit more later. One thing that I'm also not able to show is the Monte Carlo simulation module, uh, which we have used in, in last years to, to study uh, the, the, the nucleation stage, exactly the nucleation stage uh, with some kind of rare event sampling. This keyword here is transition path sampling. Uh, we have also used forward flux sampling, so statistical physics method, and we learned a lot. So this is all just for yeah, showing you that there's some, um, some things going on. Like we have a microstructure evolution model that we can couple with uh, finite element simulations. We are working on that uh, already and, and other modules. So I want to briefly go into uh, the unique thing that we have and that's the um, yeah SFFK model. I know this is not a very creative word uh, but we have used it so many times that it seems it will stay uh, like this. The basic idea is to uh, consider a technical alloy and to reduce the complexity of the of the 
precipitation reactions uh, such that we are considering spherical particles. Every uh, particle can be of a certain phase. Every particle can have a certain chemical composition. And we can describe the evolution of this precipitate populations uh, by the following uh, approach. First of all, we write down the Gibbs energy of the precipitation system. Susanna was already emphasizing the the flexibility and the uh, usefulness of the Gibbs energy uh, in thermodynamics, but we can also use that in, in kinetics. So there's one part from the energy of the matrix. There's one part related to the volume of the particles. So this is chemical potentials. And there's one part related to the surface, to the interface uh, area between matrix and precipitate. Uh, there's a sum over all the precipitates, and that's more or less a relatively simple expression for the Gibbs energy. Uh, if you also consider the dissipative processes that can occur in the system, uh, we have uh, three, which I will not go into too much detail, but this is a part that comes from interface movement. That's a, a friction part with a mobility. One over mobility means it's some kind of a friction coefficient. We have entropy production by diffusion inside the precipitate and outside the precipitate. And then uh, in the year 2000, we started this project with uh, Jerzy Svoboda and Dieter Fischer. Uh, uh, Peter Fratzl was also in the group, where we used the thermodynamic extremal principle, which means maximum entropy production, uh, which is related by this uh, unique equation. You remember that we have defined the Gibbs energy and when we have the rate of the Gibbs energy derived with respect to any of the of the system of the state parameters, this must be equal to minus one half the der derivative of the dissipation terms by the rate of this uh, state parameter. Yeah, well, when you apply this, you arrive at very simple uh, linear system of equations. Um, where the y's are again uh, either the radius evolution or the chemical composition evolution of each of the precipitates. That can be solved very efficiently for each precipitate in the system. And this is what we have actually done in the MATCAC software. So once you can have uh, the, the growth uh, and shrinkage problem is solved, there's still the part where we have to discuss nucleation. And again, uh, very short, uh, just a summary of the essence of what we use in Matkark. Uh, we are using this very classical formulation of the nucleation rate, where the nucleation rate is proportional to this exponential term. And we have this G star, which is the height of the nucleation barrier. Here's a sketch of a typical nucleation barrier, and you can see this quantity G star. Uh, here as the yeah, maximum of the nucleation barrier. Uh, these, uh, these coefficients here are more or less determined. I will show it on the next slide. Uh, just keep in mind here the G star. Uh, the G star is the nucleation, height of the nucleation barrier. And in classical theory, this is related to three times this interface energy divided by the driving force. Now, to make it short, the driving force is a thermodynamic quantity. Uh, we can use uh, computational thermodynamics to calculate it from the databases. And the question remains, how can we calculate gamma? So we have spent uh, a lot of, ah, yeah, just uh, this is the promised page. So if, if you look at these quantities, the uh, Seldovich factor, atomic attachment rate, and so on, uh, we have summarized uh, this in, in my book, actually, all the equations that you need to predict nucleation. Yeah, and the, if, if you look into that, there's, there's no uh, fitting parameter here. The only parameter that we need to discuss further is the surface free energy. And you will uh, see that this is also not a fitting parameter. Details are in the book. Yeah, how do we calculate the the interface energy. Uh, it's not a secret. 1938, Richard Becker was proposing a term where we had 
things like this here, structural factors, and uh, he had uh, atomic bond energies. Uh, Turnbull in the 60s uh, showed that you can use the enthalpy of solution, and by that relate the gamma, the interface energy, directly to a thermodynamic quantity, delta H, which can be calculated from the thermodynamic databases that you have. Now, uh, with Bernhard Sonderegger, we spent quite some time to improve this model because this was only defined for nearest neighbors. We have uh, redetermined these factors for uh, arbitrary number of neighbors. Uh, we found that you have to take into account 500 neighbor shells to, to get into convergence, but we derived this factor more or less for uh, far-ranging also interactions, which are important. We've uh, improved the model by taking into account curvature, curved interfaces, and we've also uh, dealt with the fact that interfaces uh, at finite temperatures will not be perfectly planar, but there will be some mixing of atoms between the two phases, precipitate and matrix, and we also worked on that. So we more or less developed a framework where you can really predict nucleation of a phase more or less based on thermodynamic parameters. Um, yeah. Now one part of MATCARC that I have not very often presented is the cell model, which is used for long-range diffusion. It is actually a very simple model because when you look at the spatial setup of some, yeah, some reaction where you have the volume of the sample, the first step to do is to discretize into so-called representative cells. And each of these cells is now some kind of an individual um, matkark, let's say, let's put it that way. And each of these cells can perform all the kind of simulations that you can do in matkark, just in a spatial arrangement. So one of the features that you have is the cells can communicate with each other uh, via the diffusion fluxes. Here's just again this uh, simple, uh, simple finite differences formulation. Uh, so one feature is the, the diffusion thing, and another feature is that in each of these cells, Matka can perform precipitation kinetics simulations. I've listed a few of the publications that, that are using this module. The first one is actually from 2002, which is uh, some kind of an equilibrium coupling between the cells and the precipitates. Uh, this one is uh, where uh, hydrogen diffusion was investigated in iron, carbon, niobium alloys. This is a direct coupling already between precipitates, between trapping and, and H diffusion. Yeah, and the last one is the paper that I'm going to show at the very end of my presentation. Yeah, this is the work from 2002 where we have investigated the welding zone between a, a two and a quarter chromium and a nine chromium steel, where the carbon potential is, of course, different on the two sides. Yeah, so the carbon likes to go to the nine chromium side because it's attracted by the chromium atoms. And what we did was simply uh, calculate the evolution of the carbon profile to the left and to the right of the of the welding uh, seam. You can see here the, the, the welding zone and the carbon depleted uh, region, which we more or less dealt with. So this was the first application of the cell diffusion model. The Recent application that we have worked on, and it's a very recent publication also, is done by my student Philipp Retzel. And we were considering bainite formation. And in bainite formation, there's lots of questions and lots of, uh, let's say, areas where you can do simulations. The one thing that we were doing here in this part was to consider a sheaf of bainitic subunits which is actually bainitic ferrite and a layer in between uh, of residual austenite. And we have uh, simplified that, that we, we just looked into one direction, into the thickness direction of the bainitic sheaves. And we were assuming that bainitic sheaf, uh, bainitic subunit forms, it will stop at a certain critical point, stabilized by mechanical um, 
stresses and strains. And then after a given time, another subunit will form and will compress this uh, austenitic layer a little bit. And there will be carbon diffusion from the benitic ferrite into the austenite. And we have been interested in one thing, either, uh, and the one thing in the carbon redistribution in this type of reaction, as well as can we predict the film thickness of the austenite. And I think with both uh, attempts, we have reached a yeah, fair success, not 100%, you can read it in the publication, but I will show you the success now, which is always nicer to show, show the things that work instead of showing the things that do not work. So this is our initial configuration. We start with 100% gamma, which is austenite. We assume that this gamma is quenched into the transformation region. Uh, and then we define instantaneously that a certain, a certain region of this area transforms into ferrite. So this is the ferritic sub subunit. And this is more or less the start of the simulation. You can see the carbon is distributed evenly in the beginning, and now the reaction starts. Uh, maybe one important thing, we assume that the interface is stationary. Uh, we do not assume that it will move uh, in diffusion controlled manner or whatsoever. We assume that the interface is stabilized and remains on the same position, which is a simplification. However, I don't think it's a severe one. Now, the carbon will immediately start to diffuse from the ferrite to the austenite side. And what happens is that in relatively short time, and we are talking of uh, fractions uh, less than a second, clearly less than a second, maybe up to, to a few seconds, where the ferrite is depleted and all the carbon has diffused in the residual austenite. Now, there will be a carbon profile in the austenite. Uh, and the question is now, when the next subunit forms on the right side here, how far will the interface progress into this area? And for that, uh, to answer this question, we uh, go back to the classical assumptions made by Badesha and co-workers uh, several years ago. We are considering the T0 temperature, and uh, actually the T0 prime temperature, which is a little bit uh, below the T0 temperature, so it's just a little bit of energy offset uh, which is added uh, to the calculation here. And we are considering that the next subunit can grow up to exactly this point, uh, defining the C0 prime temperature. Then the simulation continues. Uh, we define the next alpha subunit and continue the simulation and what we end up with is a prediction of first of all the thickness of the plate as well as the content the carbon enrichment in the austenitic plate yeah this is just illustration how to calculate the t0 or this uh, t0 prime concentration which is derived from the t0 prime line as a function of carbon content as well as the uh, temperature where the heat treatment is performed. We have done this calculation here for several configurations. That means we have considered two different kinds of carbon content, 0.2 and 0.4 weight percent. And we have looked at the temperature and performed the calculation such that we looked at the film thickness, first of all, and the film thickness was a function which was, which is decreasing with decreasing temperature. Not very surprising. There's lots of uh, semi-empirical equations that will predict the same thing. And we looked at the carbon content in the austenite film, and that we found to be relatively constant over temperature, at least within the, the era of our calculation, uh, with higher carbon content, this is the triangles leading to more enrichment and the lower carbon content, which is the circles, the field circles, lower carbon content. 
yeah, so this is more or less uh, the things that I wanted to show you. Uh, and I come to my my summary. First of all, if you're interested in uh, using the software, uh, there is a free version that you can use for three elements, which, uh, which has all the features and everything you need is found on the, on the Matkalk homepage. So it's easy to remember matkalk.at. Download the software, uh, look into the documentation, which we are permanently working on and so on. And uh, there's one more thing that I want to show you. Uh, we did a lot of publications already. So Matkarg is a very well de defined, uh, documented software, and everything you need to know is published on the Matkarg 6 software. I have updated it recently to also include the latest publications. It's yeah for for whatever topic you want to um, have information, you will get it on this. It's by the way, it's in the about uh, and then publications box. And just for completeness, we have uh, uh, introduced a spin-off company, which is called Matkalk Engineering, that takes care of all the support and uh, help questions and so on. You can find it on this site, so just for completeness. Yeah, and with this, I am at the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ernst, for the, for the talk. Huh? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think that there, there is probably uh, questions from the audience uh, concerning Benite. Benite is maybe if Benite or other topics. Benite is probably very interesting. Please feel free, Ari, for um, the question. So, uh, actually, I think the Benite work is perfect. I have another, a different question. Um, so, in your interface energy calculation, uh, it's basically the chemical component of the interfacial energy. Uh, but it's important to recognize, I think, that it doesn't include the structural component of interfacial energy, uh, you know, which depends on orientations and the degrees of freedom of the interface and so forth. So that, that's the only comment I wanted to make. Uh, yeah, I can, but I can answer this comment in that sense that uh, the interface energy in the nucleation stage is more or less calculated for a coherent interface. And I strongly believe that all nucleating stages are involving coherent interfaces, and then it simply have to take the chemical part. If you, if you consider the structural part also as part of the interface energy, uh, the nucleation barrier will always be so high that you will never predict any kind of precipitation. So, of course, uh, that isn't uh, really true because there is a level of coherency and an anisotropy of coherency around the particle and so on. Yeah, yeah but the structural part, if, if you just approximate it with uh, like half joule per square meter, uh, that would always uh, suppress nucleation entirely. Uh, and, and this makes me very confident. Uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the precipitate is of a complex crystal structure, yeah, there will certainly be some some uh, intermediate stages of, of precipitates uh, before some precursor phases, but the actual nucleation moment where the precipitate is formed involves coherency, and this is why I'm pretty confident that the chemical part of the of the interface energy is is the right one. Well, you have to look at uh, you know all the work that, for example, uh, Aronson and co-workers did where, you know, the interfacial energy between ferrite and austenite is of the order of 0 0.02 joules per meter squared, and it varies with the orientation of the interface. Yeah. So, and, and I think, you know, the other other issue is um, that, so I, I'm, I'm not criticizing this at all, I'm just making a comment mm -hmm. for further development, is the number density of nucleation sites is, uh, is really, really difficult to estimate as an input. Yeah, yeah it is. So we are taking just the geometry of a tetrachidecahedron to represent the grains and then count how many edges, how many corners and so are, are available and how many grain surface atoms are available for nucleation. I agree with that. Yeah. But it's it's not the entirely crucial factor because this uh, the number density of nucleation sites enters linearly. 
The really crucial part is the G star, it's the nucleation barrier. And that has a, an overwhelming uh, importance for the nucleation process. I mean, it's in the exponent yeah, and the interface energy is, is cubed. So that's a really switch on, switch off uh, quantity.